This is West Country, where we meet another local family who've worked in the same industry for generations. <laughs> St Ives in Cornwall, the tranquil harbour on the Atlantic coast of the county, a calm haven for fishermen and sailors alike. But in these still waters and safe harbour is the ever-present awareness of those who live here that conditions out at sea can be in stark contrast to this scene, and there are lives that may be lost unless others are prepared to go to the rescue. This is an Irish Coast Guard, negative. Land's End Coast Guard and uh, Chopper 528 will all work on Channel Zero. Over. Since the very first boat set sail from St Ives, the sea has shown its might over man, wrecking and casting to its depths any who dared brave her in stormy weather. For the early seafarers, well, their fate was simply in the lap of the gods, and how many desperate prayers must have been whipped away by the wind as their vessel was tossed by the waves. The Cornish coastline is notorious with sailors for its hazardous nature and many a ship has been wrecked, with cargo lost and lives too. Until 1803, when the first seagoing Cornish lifeboat was launched and members of the seafaring community decided to help those in trouble at sea. The crew in those days consisted of fishermen, coast guards, customs men and sailors. As you'd expect, there was a lifeboat in St Ives. It was first launched in 1840, and one of its crew members was likely to have been from the Cocking family. Today, the St Ives lifeboat has changed quite a bit since those early beginnings, and the crew come from all walks of life. Many rescues, lifeboats and years later, there are still Cockings on board. Tommy and William Cocking, who've been associated with the RNLI all their lives. Well-known figures in the town, they're key members of the St Ives rescue team, following in a great line of Cocking men, who earned their livelihoods by fishing and who played their part in the life-saving history of this port. Historically, records show that there were seven main families in the town of St Ives, and the Cockings were one of them. Now, we know that the Cockings must have been important because part of the harbour was actually called at one point Porth Cocking. The word Cocking used to mean small boat, little boat. These little boats have been made and sailed by generations and generations of St Ives boys through the centuries. They're called Cork and Barbers. And boats large and small have been a way of life for the Cockings for centuries. St Ives used to exist because of the sea and most of its community were associated with it. Generations of Cockings men have worked as fishermen out of St Ives Harbour and today William Cocking is no exception. As well as being a member of the lifeboat crew, William is a full-time fisherman. Today, fishing, of course, is no longer the mainstay of St Ives folk. Now tourism and the arts seem to be central to its existence. But for the ever-enduring number of fishermen, it's a way of life they wouldn't exchange. For William, the sea is in his blood, as is the call of the lifeboat. I went into the lifeboat, really, because I was brought up with it. Um, I say, when all the time I was growing up, father was 
on the crew with Bowman, then second Coxon, then Coxon. And as I say, we was just, it was there. You know, a lot of people say about ways of life, but it's more a part of your life rather than ways of life. When you go out, you don't think about it being frightening. You just, you turn the rock, you know, your bleepers go, you get to the boathouse, you get your gear, you go aboard and you go. Everybody gets on with their job, does it, and when you've done your job and pull somebody in, you, you know, it's a good feeling. I am not brave, if anything but daft, because who in their right mind, when you've got ships running for harbour for weather, would go aboard a 38-foot boat and go out in it? So, you know, we're a bit silly that way. When I was younger, when the rockets went off, it was, oh, lifeboat, yeah! You know, and say, even if he was down on the beach playing, he used to run for it. And help out if you could. It was all hands-on to get the lifeboat into the water from the boathouse on the front of the harbour wall. As the men pulled the boat with great ropes, women and children gathered to watch. It was part of the bittersweet ritual of having the lifeboat service in the port. Pulling and heaving, the men would wade into the sea until the vessel was afloat. This ritual would be woven into the history of this fishing village once tractor power was introduced. St Ives has seen many changes in the last century. You're unlikely to see the fishermen gutting their fish on the harbour wall these days. The business end of the catch is more likely to happen at the big depots at Newlyn, with the refrigerated containers ready to take the haul up country. Neither will you witness the communal net mending that used to stretch along that part of the harbour that now tourists walk in their thousands for much of the year. Mind you, gone too is the rancid smell of rotting fish or the pilchard cellars, all of which would have been familiar sights and smells to cocking ancestors. The first formal record of the cocking's involvement with the lifeboat was back in 1868. The lifeboat's existence is thanks to one Sir William Hillary, whose appeal to the nation about the tragic number of lives lost at sea resulted in the formation of the RNLI. Brian Stevens runs the St Ives Museum and is an expert on maritime history. As I suppose most people imagine, Cornwall is a place of wreckers. And I think there's a lot of romance in that because there was a lot of people that was concerned about the seafarer. But a wreck was constituted as an act of God. And they would come in their seasons, winter time, especially when things were uh, extremely low in the county with regards to food and fuel. And that meant that if a wreck came along, then there was goods and the boat being of wood, then there would be fuel to burn. As the lambs came along in the spring and the apples came in the autumn, so wrecks would come along in their season. Life in those days were very, very, very cheap. And if ever there was a wreck, the first thing they used to say was, was she carrying? Not anything about the crew like it would be today. And if there was a report, there would be this fine brig has been lost at St Ives with a cargo valued at over a thousand pounds and who the captain was. And then it would say, it is feared the crew is drowned. Well, life in the mid 19th century was extremely hard. There was a lot of poverty. Um, you must imagine that there was only the two classes, the very, very rich and the very, very poor. And that meant that those that were in mines just scratched a living and had an early death. And for those that was on the coast, then life equally was hard because if the sea didn't give up its fruit, then they starved. And if the price and the demand for fish was not there, then I'm afraid that that was the worst again for them. But for all these years, the Cochin family are as strong now as they've ever been. They got a male issue to carry on. And I think that while a cocking goes to sea, they'll be here. The sea is in their blood. As is the lifeboat. Tommy Cocking is second coxswain for St Ives, achieving a childhood ambition. He's employed full time by the RNLI. Along with Willie, he's keeping the dynasty's traditional involvement alive. For over 100 years, cocking men have passed on their experience and wisdom, father to son, generation to generation. 
Even when members of the family have lost their lives at sea, as we'll hear, the next generation have continued to respond to the maroon. Not using the old cliche, but if you ever actually do save somebody, it's a great feeling. You know, that's, you know the saying's been used many times, but really that, that's what it's all about. St Ives lifeboats make on average 35 to 40 trips out a year to help distressed sailors at sea. This boat, the Princess Royal, has masses of technical wizardry on board. It's a far cry from the early boats. Those early boats, though more pleasing to the eye, were, to say the least, basic. There was no engine, no radar, radios or computers. It was the vessel against the elements. The only power came from muscles, sails and oars. This meant there was a limit to how far a rescue could go. It was the spirit and determination of the men that were the main factors. But many hands made light work and luckily there was never a shortage of volunteers. You can't really overestimate how very much a focal part of life the lifeboat was and is. And of course the crew who manned her. The lifeboat going out or coming back from either an exercise or a rescue was always, and still is today, a reason to gather. Storms at sea can have a terrible significance for those who live along this part of the southwest coastline. As the winds blow up, the inhabitants of St Ives batten down their hatches and pray that this storm won't be remembered with its date and duration for the number of lives that have been lost. In the 1930s, there were two such storms. On a dreadful night in the winter of 1938, a vessel called the Alba was wrecked off St Ives. The crew of the Caroline Parsons went to its rescue, but with such rough seas was wrecked herself. Luckily, they were close to shore, and with the help from the St Ives people, they survived the disaster, saving the lives of those on board Alba. The crew were awarded for their bravery. If only the technology of today had been around all those years ago. After the loss of the lifeboat in 1938, tragedy was to strike again the next year. The stricken town of St Ives. Tragedy has visited this little seafaring community at the extreme end of England, and along the beach, watchers keep vigil for the bodies of the gallant crew who perished in their work of rescue. There, out on the rocks, lies the battered lifeboat, now high and dry, from which seven men were swept in the biggest gale within memory as they went to the assistance of a trawler in distress. The St Ives people were absolutely devastated by the disaster so soon after the loss of the Caroline Parsons. There was only one survivor, and the town went into mourning for the rest of the crew who were lost. The death toll included three members of the Cocking family. Mrs. Cocking, seen here, lost husband, son and son-in-law. The coffins of John Cocking and his father, the Coxon, are born from the widowed mother's home. Matthew Barber, another victim, is buried on the same day and the whole town mourns. The funerals of the other men who lost their lives are to follow. Tom Cocking, another son, walks with his sisters. They were brave men, these lifeboatmen, who gave their lives to save others. In a graveyard overlooking the stormy sea, they rest in peace. The wreck of the Eliza Stitch was burnt, but the memory of those who drowned is still crystal clear, even today. For many, that night is still present in their minds because they knew those that were lost. This is the fisherman's lodge on the St Ives Quay. It's where retired fishermen meet to discuss the day and exchange memories. I baby, you. Yeah. I'm one before my time, one and all. And people just used to come and sit here and talk. Well, they? it was a fisherman, really, you know. Yeah. We lost two lifeboats here then. No. We lost one 38 and the one 39. What were they called? Can you remember what the lifeboats were? Caroline Parsons, Eliza Stitch. Eliza Stitch. Caroline Parsons lost 1938 out on the wreck out there, Porthmere. Yeah. Then the other one got lost on the Wilson. 1939. She, she, I thought she'd never gone out. 
memories of those fateful years still alive today. One cocking, Tommy's grandfather, never got over the fact he didn't hear the call. Grandfather, he was actually in the, in the crew, but he and the second coxswain who was at the time, they lived next door to each other. They didn't hear the maroons that night. And, well, obviously, grandfather lost his father and his brother. Um, I think it had a great effect on him. I don't think he actually went in the lifeboat anymore. He may have done the odd trip or two, I've been told, but he actually gave up his position in the crew, which is quite understandable. Soon, a new lifeboat was being built for a new crew to take over. For a while, there were no cockings on board. Until in 1952, Tommy Cocking, William and Tommy's father, became part of the crew and eventually realised his lifetime ambition to be coxswain. He was lifeboat. He was brought up in a family that were connected with lifeboat. And when Tommy, particularly when he was made coxswain, he took it literally. I mean, lifeboat was every day. It was all day. And that's really as most people will remember him. When Tommy took over the Frank Penfold Marshal, um, I went out with him. But I had a pretty rude awakening because you're expected on the boat, even if you are a first aider, to know a bit about the boat. And I remember coming in on the first job we did with Tommy and I took a rope and tied a fender, something that was quite simple, but I did it the wrong way. And after it was all in, he came around, redid it and said to me, if you're coming out on a boat with me, you've got to know what you're doing or I don't want you. And that probably epitomizes what Tommy was like. He said what he wanted and you had to do it. Tommy was known as a tough taskmaster. He took no prisoners. He selected his crew with care and took his responsibilities to them seriously. They do as I tell them. And I said, once I get the message from the on sec lunch, I've got £40,000 and six men responsible for. If I go out and I make one mistake, I drown the lot. The only time I went with him as a crewman was the um, Union Crystal in November 1977. And St. Ives took part in the search. And the seas that night were reported to be something over 25 feet high. And Tommy went out and they were out seven hours. He brought the crew back because it was an open boat, remember? They were all really whacked out. And I went out with the next crew. He went again himself with the next crew. And those seas down near Pendeen were absolutely terrific. The captain of HMS Penelope wrote a personal letter to Tommy and I, I like to, if I may, just read you that, because I think Tommy probably treasured that more than most of the things he got, because it was from one professional to another professional. He wrote personally to the coxswain, expressing admiration of himself and his, life, his ship's company for the coxswain's superb handling of the lifeboat and devotion to duty of the crew, adding, we watched you in detail for some considerable time and found your performance to be outstanding. And I think that really speaks for what Tommy was. And I still remember him standing there with his white knuckles gripping the wheel and that damp cigarette hanging out of his mouth. It would never go, it was so too wet to go. And his white act pulled in over his eyes. Tommy was a brave man amongst many brave men, but his individual contribution to the RNLI did not go unrecognized. On numerous occasions, he was awarded with medals and commendations. And lifeboat's in the family. It's been in the family, and it will be always in the family, I hope. The day we brought this boat here, I thought if they men was alive now and saw what you've got now, they'd take you up the market house and burn you at the stake for being witches or something. You know, they wouldn't be able to believe the transformation of what they had to what you've got now in a relatively short space of time. When they had the old boats, they didn't go as far. I think there was one written account that the lifeboat launched at six o'clock in the evening and they rowed all night. And at six o'clock the next morning, daybreak, they were a mile and a half from the station. So, but a lot of the wrecks that happened were happening on the doorstep. Um, a lot of the old wreck books and photographs will show um, schooners and sailing ships all on the rocks, but it's like within two or three hundred yards of the stations. They, they couldn't go very far. Physically, the boat couldn't go very far. Whereas this thing we've got now, 30 miles is nothing. 
Today's lifeboat can cover many, many miles around St Ives and the technology on board today just wouldn't have been dreamt of by the early cockings. But some things never change. All seamen hold strange superstitions and the cockings have passed theirs on father to son. He was very superstitious. You wouldn't have a pasty on board and you wouldn't know to talk about things that I can't even talk about now because I believe in that a bit. Um, <laughs> white jumpers, members of the clergy, uh, all sorts of things. Three cornered biscuits. That was one of his favourites. You know, those, you get those Viennese biscuits, you know, in the Christmas things. Mum put some in a bag for me once and I opened the lid up. He went spare. He ripped them out, threw them over one. They really tasted nice too, but they, they still went overboard. Well, it isn't a case of believing them, but you don't want to take a chance just in case they are true. And what about sixth sense? The cockings share that too. You know, sometimes you're just there and you think, oh, you know, it's going to be one today, or you just get a certain feeling and sometimes it comes on, sometimes it doesn't, but, you know, it's, it's there sometimes. Like well, When you feel it and it does happen, you say, I had a feeling about that. <laughs> and when you've had a feeling that it don't happen, you, you don't, don't say nothing. anything. <laughs> Lifeboat is changing radically. The technology has changed. The boats are obviously much more um, up to date now. They're not open anymore. They're closed boats. The people that are in the boats are changing. You're beginning to get people from all walks of life. When Tommy started, you would have been somebody that worked around this harbour. You would have been a fisherman or you'd been connected with the fishing or you wouldn't have been in the lifeboat. Mm. But those days have changed and Tommy's seen that change, but he's come up with it. And um, I mean, he's still there. Uh, he's very much like his father. I think lifeboat will be his life. Boy Tommy had a very hard job to get on the crew, pulling skids, doing all the little mundane tasks that all those launching boys are expected to do, and not for months, for years, before you even got a chance of a job, even as an odd job on the lifeboat. But it shows what Tommy was like, because he had the dedication to actually keep going. Tommy's certainly got a son. Um, he's not interested at the moment, I don't think, but you never know. Times are changing, and I don't think we'll have people like Father Tommy and Boy Tommy who devote their life completely to lifeboat again. I don't think we live in a world where people do that. These days, of course, bravery and goodwill aren't enough. Hard commercial facts of life have meant that the people of St Ives, as elsewhere, have to be really involved in fundraising to keep their rescue service afloat. Open days attract tourists and locals alike. It's a chance to get on board the boat, to buy souvenirs and to ask questions of the local heroes. Local heroes that have included cockings amongst their number for at least 130 years. It's a lovely thought now to think that where this lifeboat station is, is not far from the rock that bears their name. So the lifeboat is really built upon the rock, Porth Cock and Rock. Several people will say, oh, it's a wonderful thing you do. Well, I agree, with, I suppose it is really, but it's everyone to their own. You know? I, I wouldn't fancy going into a house that's on fire. You know, firemen do a wonderful job. <laughs> It's not my scene. If the day ever came when I went out there thinking to myself, oh, I don't know about this, it's time to pack up when you're like that. I'll sing you a song of the fish of the sea, away the royal. I'll sing you a song of the fish of the sea, for a bang for the royal crown. Then away. Farewell to Sue, away the royal, so fare well, my pretty young girl.